I hated being in the bank every day and wearing a suit and getting paid like $40,000 a year to just like move people's money around. Not really have a life, right? Wells Fargo people were notorious for like talking shit about all of the other companies out there, essentially. Getting into the bank, everybody thinks when you work at the bank, you have to have like these credentials, but you find out quickly that all the bankers are the ones with zero credentials. Ira Cornelius is the co-founder of Pay Compass, a payment technology company in Tempe, Arizona. With a decade of experience in the payments industry, he's a seasoned expert. Ira is also a dedicated husband, father of two, and an extreme sports junkie, always seeking new adventures. How is it being your own boss? Because there is a lot of misconception, you know, when you run your own business, you're free. Maybe I spent the entire day or the entire week at the beach with my family, but in between those moments, I'm thinking of the next deal. 2020 was like the hardest year of my life. It was hard on my marriage. Um, it was hard with my kids. Trying to figure out like, what did I do? I don't know how we're gonna pay our mortgage. I don't know how we're gonna make our car payments. We don't have any money in the bank account. You have years that are down. You have years that you're simply stagnant. And then you have other years that are good. And just because you've been doing good and having high growth does not mean that it's going to continue. Because you have to figure out how to navigate that or it will, it'll crush you, you know? The money's great, but the the mental part of it will crush you if you're not strong enough. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. If you don't like a question, you can say, Vlad, f off. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's think yeah. about this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, can we, we can say, f that's good. That's <laughs> yeah, we'll just edit it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe it'll bring more views. Maybe not. I, in my bad people like it, dude. Yeah. yeah. It'll bring the wrong kind of views. <laughs> well, especially if, you, yeah, especially if you guys are marketing to teachers Edu exactly, and educators. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure they don't really like that. I mean, maybe retired teachers, they will like it. Who knows? Actually, yeah, right now we are exactly. looking for retired teachers. So. Ira, welcome. Welcome to our show. Thanks for having us, guys. I really appreciate it. Excited to be here. So I know that you work for yourself. There is no eight to five job. No one is controlling you. And you have a beautiful wife and two kids. Could you please Thank take you. us back to when it all started. How did you get into the industry of merchant services and integrated software integrations? Yeah, so my journey started back in banking when I was 18. Um, and even before that, my dad uh, is a tile setter. And during the summers when I was in my teens, I would work with him in the hot summer doing tile, which I absolutely hated. And uh, I knew back then like the physical route of, you know, um, working a job was not for me essentially. So I wanted to go something more professional, which nobody in my family had really done that. So I figured that, you know, banking would be a good start, right? It's like, where did we put their money? They put it in a bank. Um, so I want to be around it. I had like an interest in it. So I got a job at Wells Fargo as a teller um, and worked my way up from teller to personal banker to business specialist after about three years. And the business specialist job was to Basically, any any business that was coming into the bank and needed to open a bank account or do anything business related would come and sit with me. And it was my opportunity to network with a lot of different entrepreneurs, um, whether they were landscape professionals, construction guys, um, financial advisors that were 1099, uh, businesses like yours, you know, wholesalers. There were so many different businesses. I met the owner of uh, V's Barbershop one time, you know, and there was just like multiple different people coming in. And it opened my eyes quickly to realize that like I hated being in the bank every day and wearing a suit and getting paid like $40,000 a year to just like move people's money around and not really have a life, right? But that's what made me realize um, that there were other avenues and that I needed to get out of that like corporate structure. Uh, but another job that I had there was to send referrals over to the merchant services department and then also the payroll department. So the merchant services was intriguing to me because- these guys, I would send a referral over to them. They would drive up in their Mercedes. And I'm young at the time, right? So you see flashy objects, shiny objects. <laughs> These guys would drive up in a Mercedes, wear flip flops with their suit. They would come in. They would sign an application contract with one of the business owners. And then they would leave. 
And I'm like, what are these guys doing? You know, like I want to do what they're doing. They don't got to be here. They come and close a deal and they leave. And they were highly paid at the time from my perspective of highly paid back then. So I asked a bunch of people, I was like, you know, tell me about the merchant services industry. Um, and they're like, it's great. You know, it's residual income and you know, closing deals. It's pretty saturated, but you know, if you have the grit, you can do it. And I started looking into some other companies and uh, I got very involved on LinkedIn when the company Harkland Payment Systems um, recruited me, wanted to recruit me and, and talk to me about, you know, coming over as a W-2 outside sales rep, 100% commission. So Wells Fargo people were notorious for like talking shit about all of the other companies out there, essentially. Um, and I brought up the fact that I was entertaining a position at Heartland Payment Systems and none of them had a bad thing to say. So I took that as, you know, kind of a sign that like, all right, well, this is a uncapped commission only position that I've never been in before, but I'm miserable where I'm at at the bank. I'm a corporate nightmare. HR hates me. I'm going to get fired for saying the wrong thing. So I, I jump ship, right? My parents are like, don't do it. You have a good job. You got a 401k, you have security, you know, which they've always gone down that path. It's the whole like standard traditional entrepreneur story of going against what your parents say and all that stuff, right? So I jumped ship um, and I went over there. And in the first three months, I made more money than I did in two years um, at Wells Fargo with a salary. And I was like, this is it, right? And um, that's what essentially got me into the industry. So I worked there for uh, about four years, worked my way up as a top sales rep out of 4,000 employees. I was um, you know, top 50 in that company. It was a huge company. Um, and then that company sold to Global Payments for $4 billion dollars. Um, and then Bob Carr, the owner of that company, only had a one year not compete when he sold it. So he left and started another company called Beyond. I jumped into the ground floor and helped him found that company with a few other guys um, from the Heartland days. And we grew it pretty large over three years, but it just didn't go in the right direction that I wanted it to. Um, so my now business partner who got me in um, to the industry, he's the one that hired me at Heartland. We left and started our own company four years ago, which is Pay Compass. Uh, we now have over 200 agents nationwide. Uh, we're doing $2 billion a year in transaction volume. Uh, we have partnerships all over the place. You can process in America, Canada, Mexico, um, and a few other places. But we're growing, we're growing rapidly. And um, it's been a, been a crazy journey to get here, but it's been a fun one. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. What background did you have before you joined the bank? Did you have any background in banking or it was just... I was 18. I was smoking weed and partying, dude. That's what I was doing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was my background back then. Cool. Yeah, not much. I uh, it, Getting into the bank, everybody thinks when you work at the bank, you have to have like these credentials. But you find out quickly that all the bankers are the ones with zero credentials, hmm. right? So like, it's like the traditional, oh, you got to go to college. You have to get a traditional education to get a good job, which, you know, a lot of people are now looking at that as like, that's not really the way. Um, if, you know, if you kind of have like an entrepreneur type mindset and I did not go to college, you know, I just was not, my wife did, she went for four years and got a communication degree. And then I just worked at the bank and, and networked my way into, you know, different things. But I quickly found out that the majority of other people at the bank were all just people like me, <laughs> no education, wanted to work professional job and uh, kind of sell their way into that place. So before I'll dive into the technicalities of, of, the, of your business side, I'd like to talk about, you mentioned that right now you are self-employed, it's your business, so I want to speak about it. How is it being your own boss? Because there is a lot of misconception, you know, when you run your own business, you're free, you, you know, you do whatever you fucking want, you know, but in reality, your brain never shuts off. So what is no. it? What is it for you to being your own boss? I mean, if I were to highlight the positives first and then go into the negatives, the, the positives are uh, I have not missed a day with my kids since they were born, right? 
Uh, I've been with them every single day. There's there's never been a a soccer game. There's never been a doctor's appointment. There's never been a jujitsu practice. There's never been anything that I've ever missed, regardless of what day it is or what time it is. Right? Um, there has been a lot of vacations in the middle of the year when most people are you know working and doing their jobs. A lot of people travel when their kids are you know out of school in the summertime and stuff. So we can travel uh, in January. We can travel in. November. We can travel whenever we want, just kind of on a whim, right? Um, and those are a lot of the positive, right? My wife and I have had a lot of freedom from it, but there's a ton of negatives, which are the things that people don't think about. It was one, building the company, right? From the ground up. Like I own the majority of a large portion of the portfolio of the entire company. It's my personal portfolio of merchants. Um, and Building that from, because it started in February of 2020, uh, and in this business, until you start gaining clients and building out a portfolio, there is no revenue at all for the company. And the beautiful thing about our business is that the overhead is, is very minimal, right? And, and when it comes to tax time, that's also the shitty part, but the overhead is very, the overhead is very minimal, right? So uh, once you build out the portfolio, the revenue is essentially just profit for the company. I, in February of 2020, started the company, my business partner and I, and then, you know, the world shut down in March with COVID. And we're like, what the fuck did we just do? Like, why did we start a company now? You can't go out and shake hands with people. You can't, you know, the world's shut. Everybody's freaking out about this disease and all this stuff. And uh, 2020 was like the hardest year of my life. It was hard on my marriage. Um, it was hard with my kids. Uh, it was hard mentally. I mean, I, I would come home broken down multiple times a day, just trying to figure out like, what did I do? I don't know how we're going to pay our mortgage. I don't know how we're going to make our car payments. We don't have any money in the bank account. Like this is the, the most tough thing I've ever done. But, you know, despite all of that, getting through 2020 um, and then through 2021, things started to kind of shift to where we started getting our life back after getting our feet off the ground. And on, on the other side of adversity, right, is, is growth, you know? And I found that that's kind of a, a two-year cycle. Every two years, there's a lot of adversity. And then you have a whole year of adversity and you grow tremendously, but that year kind of sucked ass, you know? And that's not what people see. People don't see that stuff, right? It's like um, last year, I just finished up a lawsuit with my previous company. And people don't know about those things. They came after me for solicitation, couldn't prove it. And um, it was, but it was a big company versus a small company. And what do they do? They poke and poke and poke and poke for two years. And the attorney's bills are 10 grand this month, 15 grand this month, 20 grand this month. And at the end of it all, you know, you settle for nothing, but how much did it cost you over the past couple of years? And not only financially, it was also a mental struggle, right? Of not knowing what they were going to hit me with next, you know, and gosh, how am I going to pay that? So you know, that's that's the part of owning a business that, you know, a high, highly paid employee does not have to deal with. Right. And I think that the other struggles of never being able to turn it off, like you said, Vlad, is is 100 percent true. Like whether I'm in warrior sculpt with you and Danny's yeah. telling me to lay silent, and not think about anything. And <laughs> there's little things creeping in my head. Of course, they're creeping in my head the entire class. Like, man, I got to email this guy back. I have to do this. I shouldn't be doing emails anymore. I should be hiring an admin. I need to do an admin that does 80% of the work for me, you know, so I can just focus on, you know, doing what I like to do, the things that light me up. And those are all things that like people, like I have a, one of my best friends, she's, um, her, his, his wife is a nurse practitioner and she's nine to five, right? And when she goes home, she's off work and she just relaxes. And I'm just like, I don't know what that's like because maybe I spent the entire day or the entire week at the beach with my family. But of course, I'm present with my kids and I play. But in between those moments, I'm thinking of the next deal. I'm thinking of the person I was supposed to call back. I'm thinking of who are we hiring? Like all these agents that I have that I'm trying to support, like their deals, right? Oh, I need to log into my system and see. There's just a, there's an influx of thoughts that just never leave your head. So if you're okay with that, it's beautiful, right? I will take this over, you know, going and working for somebody else and being told what I'm worth all day long, but it doesn't mean that it's easy because you have to figure out how to navigate that or it will, it'll crush you. You know, the money's great, 
but the the mental part of it will crush you if you're not strong enough. And now if you look back when you was 18, when you was joining the bank, what advice would you give with yourself? That's hard because I, I don't like regret my path, you know? So like going back and like saying, what advice would I give myself? Um, I would probably say, I, I probably would have gone out on my own earlier, you know? And I, I, I would have focused on like, if you're talking from like a technical standpoint, I would have focused on integrated payments more um, earlier on because now that's what a lot of people are focusing on now. And we'll get into that, the kind of what that means in, in the next uh, question or so. But I would have focused more on on those things back then, it's, it, which were longer term deals rather than the short term. Because when I first got into it, like most people, you're trying to you know hustle and make money quick because you need it. And I was focusing too much on that rather than long term deals that if I would have worked on them then I would it would I'd be in a completely different position right now you know so not that I'm in a bad one but it would be much further forward than I am right now I want to highlight some of the things you said I want to call that out to the audience again because I think you made some really good points that a lot of uh, want to be entrepreneurs uh, forget or people that aspire to one day start their business which is, uh, it is a vicious cycle. Uh, you have years that are down, you have years that you're simply stagnant, and then you have other years that are good. And just because you've been doing good and having high growth uh, or potentially hyper growth for two, three years in a row does not mean that it's going to continue. Uh, it's all a cycle. And yeah, managing that, managing the highs, managing the lows, you know, uh, in, in this, in this, land that we live in the lows are super low and the highs are super high and a lot of people a lot of w2 workers cannot relate to that you know sometimes you're a little pissed a little tired but as an entrepreneur uh, your wins are it's a, it's a super high and those losses potential lawsuit or something catastrophic that happens or you know your 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 your, your lead engineer decides to quit or whatever the, those are catastrophic <laughs> lows uh and so that's definitely not a journey for everyone uh but you know for for those of us who who do it we, you know we, we love it but it's certainly very very challenging uh i want to kind of go into the technical aspects of it so i i'm not you know we're in the education space and publishing space so I would love to learn a little bit more about uh, merchant services and integrated software payments. So I, when I think of that, I think of Stripe. So can you please explain uh, uh, in basic terms, what are merchant services and then the integrated software payments part? Imagine that we are super, super stupid about it. So, Okay. So when you pay with your card <laughs> at a store, no, it's just, <laughs> but uh, no, so, so there's two sides of banking. There's um, the issuing side of banking, and then there's the acquiring side of banking. Issuing is um, like Visa, Mascard, Amex, Discover. Uh, they work with big banks like Wells Fargo, B of H, Chase, U.S. Bank, all the big banks and the small ones to issue cards out to customers like you and I, right? So I'm sure you guys have multiple credit cards um, with different rewards, points, business, or personal. Um, so they issue those cards out. Those cards have something called an interchange rate on it. To where every time that customer with that card goes and spends it at a business, that business now pays a rate on it that pays for the rewards points that you get. So that's kind of the cycle of it, right? Mm. So then the business that's accepting those cards, they're on the acquiring side of banking, right? Which is what we're on. So they have to set up a merchant account that is approved based on the processing parameters of their business to be able to acquire the payments in their business for purchase, right? Um, and that's where we come in. So there's multiple different uh, independent sales organizations out there, uh, which is what we are, that resell for big processors like TSIS or First Data. And I always say it's similar to like an insurance brokerage where, you know, if you're in insurance and you're like, you have, you know, Ira Cornelius Insurance Agency, you may resell for, you know, Geico and, you know, these multiple different ones, you kind of shop it out. Well, for us, you know, you start with us for the merchant account. We analyze what your business needs, whether it's an e-commerce or retail, a restaurant, a B2B, an integrated option, uh, non-customer facing invoicing. We kind of figure out where, like what kind of payment system you need. We set up your merchant account. 
we ask you those different questions as far as what are your average ticket sales? You know, is it a hundred dollars, two hundred, three hundred? How do you process those sales? Is it keyed in? Is it invoiced? Is it swiped? Is it through a point of sale? What's a higher ticket? Do you guys have products that you ship out? Future delivery, right? We put all that stuff on an application. We send it into underwriting. The sponsor bank approves it. And then we put in their equipment. So whether it's a terminal, a point of sale, a gateway to integrate with their e-commerce store. Um, and then we manage the relationship from there. So if they have any issues, uh, then they can call us directly and we answer the phones, right? Mm. Um, so it's as simple as that, right? It's not a very complicated business model because we didn't have to build anything out except the sales channels, right? We don't try to reinvent the wheel. We use what's available to us. Um, and then we acquire the business and we, you know, provide value to people and we charge, um, you know, basis points essentially or a percentage above interchange, what I was talking about earlier, um, for our services. And that's how we make our money. Hmm. That's a good, good point to segue to the next question. Has this industry evolved over the past 10 years or is it really kind of the same still? Oh yeah, no, it's evolved substantially. I mean, just in the past year, 10 years alone, you know, you had everybody, the EMV liability ship was the biggest, you know, thing to shock the industry um, since plastic came out essentially, which is the chips. What e- EMV? The chips on the credit cards and debit cards that you see. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, Euro, it's like Euro MasterCard Visa is what I believe it stands for. And that's when it was in October of 2016. That was the biggest shift, right? So you're talking about you know, taking equipment that didn't have the ability to even accept those to moving all these hardware manufacturers and equipment over to it. And still to this day, there's still some point of sale companies out there, legacy point of sales that work with big name restaurants and stuff that still don't have that technology. Uh, But that was the biggest shift because it's been around in Europe and Canada and other parts of the world for a very long time. It's older technology, but the US was the last one to adopt it. Um, which is also why fraud was so high in America for the longest time, because we didn't have this, we didn't have this here. So that was a very big shift, um, in the evolution of it here. But then, you know, a lot of things have also gone to integrated payments, um, which, and that's why I've really specialized in that too. And integrated payments are basically like, if you guys have a software that runs your business, uh, like a, like a ERP or a CRM or something along those lines, and you need to run payments through there as well, uh, that would be an integrated payment option, right? So I I work with other software vendors to provide, you know, an integrated option uh, so that they can have ownership in the merchant accounts on the back end, get a revenue split on the gener- on the revenue that's generated, and then also have a better payment offering for their customers, um, depending on what they need. And then it's a white labeled solution too. So if it's, you know, Argo prep, point of sale, it's now Argo Prep point of sale payments, right? Because you guys have it in house. Um, so that's why I really specialized in that. And then the benefit on my side is, you know, instead of having to go out and gather individual merchant accounts, we're now looking at this software company has all these different businesses already in their portfolio. Now they're going to offer integrated payments to them um, and they're going to market it to them and figure out a way to sign all these customers up. And I don't have to do anything for it, mm. right? So my portfolio grows without me actually having to put any effort into it after the integration is done. When does it make, so I'm I'm trying to understand what the perfect target customer or business looks like. So for example, so I I want to kind of put, compare it up to Stripe because Stripe is obviously one of the leading or probably I'm assuming the leading uh, uh, company. So so we use Stripe for many of our companies. Uh, what, What business fits or where does that come in where does your services come in where would outperform, let's say, Stripe fees? Because I, I do know Stripe fees add up based on volume. Or So I kind of want to take a look at uh, what a good business, what case a business should transition over to another company. Yeah, Stripe was really designed for e-commerce for okay. the most part, e-commerce. right? So right. if you're looking for... Um, you know, if you're looking for something like you guys are doing recurring billing or you guys are sending out an invoicing or you guys have it on your website, Stripe is always a great option. Um, and then you have companies like Shopify, right, who have basically dominated the market in the e-commerce space. Right. Well, they also use Stripe and then they white label it as Shopify mm-hmm. payments. Um, so that's a that's a great option for it. 
But the issue with the Stripes and the PayPals and the Squares of the world, are they have uh, what's called a PayFat model, which is called Payment Facilitator, where they take on all the risk of processing, which there is a lot. There, the majority of risk and fraud goes on in a payment in a credit card transaction, right? So, uh, what they do is they instantly approve everybody. Right. And if you're the wrong business model, what will happen is that you'll shoot yourself in the foot because Stripe shuts merchant accounts down all the time, screwing people's cash flow up. Because what will happen is, is if I'm a business and I actually sell a product that may not, uh, that may be in a higher risk category, right? Let's say it's higher risk. And then maybe I have, I'm not customer facing. So the card is keyed in. And then I'm, you know, sending that out to a customer and it won't be delivered for two weeks, which may give the customer cold feet on their purchase. There's a really high risk for chargebacks right. um, where the customer can call their bank, charge the payment back. And that's that's risk for banks and processors for a loss, right? Um, so what happens is, is if, customer, if companies like that sign up for Stripe and they're not underwritten up front like we would do, and mm. they get their account shut down or held, Stripe will hold their funds for 90, 100, up to 540 days, which could be, depending on the card, the actual extended chargeback period, and not do anything about it. You're just screwed. So, And sometimes what they'll do is they'll also put you on what's called a match list, which I'm dealing with a couple of these right now, uh, where when they put you on a match list, that means that you have money owed or a chargeback was paid. And if you're on a match list, your business cannot get a merchant account with anybody so it, it with anybody so that means you can't accept credit cards for your business and if you can't accept credit cards for your business in today's age it means you pretty much can't be in business right mm-hmm. so that's why that's where a traditional processor comes in so strong is that you know i work with companies that are doing three four five million dollars a month um they want the local service they want to be underwritten correctly they have mm-hmm. different needs with you know their point of sales and their hardware some of them may be on a different pricing structure where they're passing along to the customer and they want to make sure that they're compliant. They want a system to do that. Um, so there's so many different scenarios, you know, as far as it goes. Like, that's why restaurants don't use Stripe. That's mm-hmm. why, you right. know, retail stores don't use Stripe. That's why, you know, a company like maybe like yours, maybe a, comp- a bookstore or a book company that's manufacturing the books and putting them together and setting them out or something like they would be accepting payments on a gateway that wouldn't be striped, right? So there's there's so many different types of businesses out there that just have higher risk levels that need to be underwritten because Stripe is is great for a lot, but not all. What about AI? What do you think about AI? Will it help or is it helping already? I just don't mess it around with it, dude. It depends on how you use it, you know? Like, I think if you're going to use it to market yourself, sure. I think with with AI and merchant services in particular, like we have, you know, these different terminals like Deja Vu has different AI already integrated into some terminals. But as far as like helping merchant services, I'm sure they'll figure out a way to do it. At this point, I don't really hear any anything much besides just individuals using it to like grow their portfolio, essentially. Like 10 best, uh, 10 best uh, processors, you know, you can write a, an article with, chat gpt in in two seconds you know and post it and then collect a bunch of different emails right like a like a news article but as far as ai goes for um terminals and processing and and all that i don't i don't necessarily know where it's going to go with that yet but i'm sure it's going to take over and we'll probably all be jobless at some point (laughs) (laughs) if we don't adopt but we are entrepreneurs we know how to adapt hey i'm i'm using it every day i i was talking to somebody the other day and he's like I don't know why you use Google anymore. Just use ChatGPT. Like, just ask ChatGPT. It, it does everything that Google will times a million. And I know Google's got their own AI now, but I'm not worried about the individuals. I worry about us as a society. What happens then? Because you have all sorts of people. We know that reskilling individuals is very, very hard. A 50-year-old transitioning or a 60-year-old transitioning into a different industry is extremely hard. Getting a cab driver, uh, that's, you know, that's one of the biggest, like these are big issues that we talk about. You know, we, uh, what happens when self-driving cars comes along? If legislation passes and if we truly do have these robo-taxis, how do we reskill these workers? We know the data is there. The data is already out there that reskilling workers is extremely hard on not at the individual level, but as, as, a, as a level at society. 
I mean, come on, it's always been it's always been there. When internet wasn't wasn't true. around, same when it came out, also everybody's supposed to be risk uh, reskilled. So it happened. We adopted as a society. So I think it's gonna be yeah. And and plus we just you know immersed in this field. We you know we use AI here and there. But if you go out to the street and ask some random Nobody, people, right. do you know GPT? They look at it. They look at you and say, "What the hell is this?" I think majority of people they have no idea. Yeah, they may have heard of it because they're talking about it on the news now. Like my parents, for instance, you know, are are close to sixty and they talk. They still watch the news. They love watching it. I tell them not to, but they do. And they're like, "Yeah, I hear AI this and AI that," but they're not. They don't have the apps on their phones. They're not logging in and using it. They just talk about it or are familiar with the term AI. Yeah. But yeah, how many people are actually using it? Right. Who knows. Well, Probably a minuscule amount. I'm excited to see when there's going to be a company that hits a billion dollars in revenue with a t- with a t- employee team size less than ten. It's going to happen. I, I think so. I uh, maybe not right now, but in a couple of years because these LLMs are very powerful and the tools, the productivity outputs of these are absolutely insane. And Vlad, you know, you you, you know, we we play with, around with a lot of tools. Uh, you know, it, it just to just to stay ahead of the game every every week, every two weeks, uh, we're quite surprised. It's not perfect, right? You still need humans, and I can, you still need employees. We still need our team. We love our team, uh, but I'm telling you, man, these these things, uh, the the productivity output is three four hundred percent. You know what, yeah. what an employee would do in eight hours takes literally two, two hours. It's it, it's crazy. Whatever, I'm 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 super excited. But again, I'm not thinking at the individual level. I always like to think at, at, at a, as a level of society. Uh, in any case, uh, super exciting. We'll 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 get back to that question in a couple of years. Let's see where everybody is at. Uh, I kind of want to. Yeah. Uh, do you have any story uh, a, a story to share where you came into a business and you significantly improved their business operation? Perhaps they didn't have a integrated payment solution, or maybe. They were maybe they had one and it was horrible and they finally switched and you, you know the, the the cash flow end was uh, seamless. Any 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 stories like that? I have a, a company that I did an integration with called More Active and they're a fitness platform um, that communicates with essentially like doctor to uh, patient, right? And whether that's physical therapy or um, you know traditional MD or natural path, and there's multiple like monthly basically monthly subscriptions that they are charging for different levels of the platform and it's all white labeled and they were originally with stripe and stripe doesn't like subscription models for anything more than month to month um Mm. so they shut down many of their merchant accounts Mm. we were able to go in and integrate into their system through our platform called passport and add a bunch of functionalities like debit cards to the customers, bank accounts for the customers, or a full banking platform that we integrated into it. And then also uh, strike a deal with our risk team to get you know instant approvals um, for them, just like Stripe does. And then we can also do annual, semi-annual, and monthly mm. billing for them uh, for no, no issue at all, right? So this really uh, kept his business afloat, right? Because he's $7 million in the hole yeah. in starting this, but just now getting his revenue going um, and Stripe instantly shut him down you know after about a month or two after he started processing so that's one for the integrated option um some other ones i've done uh some other softwares where we we pulled them off of stripe integrated ours because stripe doesn't do revenue shares for the most part with these businesses but these businesses that have these softwares are processing a lot of volume through stripe and they're mm-hmm. not getting any portion of it so right. not only are we giving them a, a massive revenue share and we're we're taking their because SaaS companies, you know, a lot of them are doing ninety nine, two ninety nine, three ninety nine a month, right? So they got to have a lot of users to be able right. to create, you know, substantial revenue. Well, now you take that three ninety nine a month user who's doing a hundred thousand dollars a month in volume, and you add another thousand dollars a month in profit, it's right, to that user. It's a lot to the bottom. You line, just yeah. double, triple, yeah, you tripled your business, right? And not only are they getting the revenue per client, they're also getting ownership account um and what a lot of people don't realize is that these merchant accounts sell for 50 40 50 x whatever the monthly is on a free month rolling when you exit the company so when we when when we um you know talk to to software vendors i've realized doing this for a while now a lot of these software guys are just software guys and they think about payment processing as an afterthought 
And they add in a company like Stripe because they have amazing APIs and e easy integrations. And it's like, everybody knows it. It's like a PayPal, the Stripes of the world, right? So they do that afterthought. And then here comes Ira saying, hey, that's a dumb idea, dude. And here's how much money you're giving up on all these accounts that you have. Mm. And then they redo it and I become the hero. We all make money together and everybody's happy. Um, and then on the traditional side, I mean, what's really popular now is is uh, dual pricing where people have a card price and a cash price listed. Um, I have a, a company here that does, you know, in their busy season, two to three million dollars a month. Um, and they have an average ticket of about a hundred dollars to get into the place. And they're adding a four percent fee for cars. So it's an average of about, you know, a hundred and four dollars now to get into the place. Not a customer cares whatsoever. But it saved them over five hundred thousand dollars a year in processing fees wow. um, that they were able to put back into the business and expand in multiple different ways. I have another customer of mine that just moved over to this program. They're saving over twelve thousand dollars a month in fees now, and they're able to not go into debt, opening a second location in uh, Utah. So there's so many different success stories of, of different programs, right? It just kind of depends on on the deal, which is my favorite part about this business is meeting different mm -hmm. people, um, listening to their story, and just connecting with them on a on a friend to friend, human to human level. And then finding out if we can do business together. You know, mm. let's see what I can do to provide value. Let's work together. Let's grow this thing together, right? And become friends and refer business back and forth. And that's how I've essentially grown my portfolio and and our business today. And the same goes for all of our agents nationwide. I mean, we we work with a lot of people now that we worked with back in the Heartland days, and we all just stayed in contact and kind of you know gradually moved to each company and when you know beyond just sold for pennies on the dollar and thankfully so like everybody left and they they came over here you know and um it's been it's been fun to watch it grow and um i'm more than excited to see like what the next 10 years holds with us because we're having substantial growth awesome no i've been doing i've been yeah. doing prep before the interview and i found a company called merchant merchant one and I believe it's one mm -hmm. of the competitors to you, one of the huge ones. So what's uh, what advantage can you provide when we compare these two companies, yours and them? The price point, I've never the even price heard of point them. or something. I've never even heard of them, to be honest. There's, uh, there's a lot of ISOs out there. So there's an ISO stands for independent sales organization. And you have, you have, you have TSIS, first data, you have Global Payments, who bought out TSIS, and Pfizer, who bought out First Data. And then you have the Heartlands of the world, and you have Elevon, Payment Tech. There's only so many platforms that you can actually, that are actual front-end and back-end processors. So like when you swipe or dip a card, and it prints out a receipt uh, seconds later, what it's doing is it's pinging a bank, right? To make sure they have the money, and then saying, yes, there's the money. And then it sends back a signal to close out that transaction and print off a receipt with an authorization. All those big companies I just named, that's the technology that they created, right? So then you have Merchant Ones, Pay Compass, you have the Beyonds, you have these big independent sales organizations that are all run a bit differently, right? Um, the standard practice in our industry is, is to rip people off. That's what a lot of people do in this industry. Merchant Services has always put a bad taste in a lot of business, small business owners' mouths because... There's a lot of untrained, unregulated individuals that get into this industry and they go out and they promise people the world, lie to their faces. And then these small businesses, they gobble up that information like, this is great. We're going to get everything from this guy. A month later after processing, they don't get anything that they were promised. They're locked into a contract. Mm -hmm. They're locked into some equipment lease that they didn't even realize that they signed. Right. And then they can't call anybody and ask anybody, how do I get out of this? So they get stuck into it. So then somebody again comes in and he promises them the world. And maybe he's a little bit better and fixes a couple of problems. Well, over time, same thing happens. Well, now his rate's getting increased every six months, right? They're doing, they, they promised him a rate and it was an introductory rate. And then six months later, he gets a rate increase and another rate increase. So then he's back to where he was before. And then somebody like myself gets referred in there. And they're like, I don't like people like you. You know, like I've had, I have a bad taste in my mouth. You guys have screwed me over and I come in and I can explain to him how I understand what he's been through. And I can basically say, 
I, without you even telling me your story, I can guarantee you, I can already tell it back to you, like what it was. And Mm -hmm. most of the time that's true because it's so common. Right. And so we can come in and not put people in contracts month to month. They have my cell phone number, right? So they have a personal relationship with their merchant guy. Oh, I have a merchant problem. Call Ira. He's your guy. Call his team. He's your guy. Right. Um, you put them on programs that can save 100% of their fees, 70% of their fees, or just knock them down a little bit, right? We can put in the systems that they want in there with no monthly costs on them, with no leasing. They would purchase them, or depending on the deal, we can purchase them for them. So maybe no upfront cost, right? Um, where it's just transparent and honest and um, just good old traditional business, right? Like you do business with somebody that you like, you're getting exactly what you want. You have the pricing that you think is fair and there's no nonsense, right? right? And you're getting a good service. So so that's one of the biggest differences, honestly, between uh, us and a lot of other people is just following through on what you're going to say. When it comes to a technological standpoint, there's we didn't really reinvent the wheel there either, but we have access to everything available. So there's never a deal that we walk into or get introduced to that we can't provide a, an amazing solution for. Um, so whether it's high risk, right? Because a lot of high risk guys get shut down all the time and they need a a sustainable solution to be able to, you know, run their business. And we have that because we have the relationships with those sponsor banks that approve those, right? Um, whether it's a point of sale company and they don't want to go with the toasts of the world, you know. Uh, we have all the relationships with all the processor agnostic point of sale companies out there. And we also have our own in-house ones, right? We have Clover. Um, as far as e-commerce goes, we have every gateway possible that we're agnostic to, depending on you know what we need to do to integrate with their shopping cart, right? So there's, it's just a matter of of just being honest. It's kind of boring because it's just honest and transparent, and it's nothing special. It's just good business practices, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, and uh, there's just a lot of people out there that don't do that at all. They they scam people. They're uneducated in the business. Um, they hire the wrong agents. The guys that, you know, own the ISOs are the ones hiring those people. They screw the agents over out of their commissions every single month. They end up taking them back from them. And then that guy that screwed the people over goes and works for another uh, ISO, so does the same thing. thing. Oh, so, man. That's a vicious yeah, cycle. it's just, it is, you know, and, and that happens though in, in a lot of industries. I mean, okay. you look at the used car industry, you look at the insurance industry, you look at multiple different industries. There's just a lot of bad people out there that are doing bad things. Why do we have so many middlemen in these industries? Like, okay, you just brought up a really good point, like car salesmen or like, here I can't get a car without going through a damn dealership. Why is that? Yeah. I mean, I, I know it's, I'm not uh, asking you the question directly, I suppose, because, you know, but yeah. why is that? I mean, you know, it's it's crazy. Why can't I go to BMW.com, build my car, get it shipped directly to me without it going through a BMW Manhattan dealership? And then they say, well, hello, my friend. Actually, you have to pay an additional $8,000 because we also cleaned your car. And here's a premium package that we've added on. So this is what you can do with Genesis, no? <laughs> uh, no, it's Tesla. Tesla is the only one where you can buy directly. Genesis, you're still going through the dealership. They're in Hyundai. Hyundai. Uh. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's terrible. They don't. Genesis doesn't even have their own dealership. I like. I love the car, but uh, it's you walk in, it's like Hyundai, and then they have like a little small section for Genesis, and it's it's bizarre. It's bizarre. They it's funny because that's their job. luxury brand, right? That's how it's luxury brand. Which they're wonderful cars, but they should have a Genesis dealer. The, you yes. know, just like a Toyota Lexus. They shouldn't sell Lexus at a Toyota dealership. They Lexus is Lexus. I completely agree with you. But aside from that fact, yeah, I I just, I, so it's interesting because there are like, as you, as you mentioned in these industries, there's tons of brokers, everybody's using white label solutions. If we wanted to go directly to the company that creates the software, can you do that or no? These companies thrive off of just white labeling and having, you know, 10,000, tens and thousands of, or maybe even hundreds of thousands of brokers. Uh, yeah, I mean, so like if you just think like Tesis Direct or First Data Direct, um, they are they don't want sales channels, you know, because they just make their money off of small transaction fees on everybody that's on the platform, mm, right? Okay. And uh, so that's why uh, otherwise, how do they acquire the business? You know, that's why even Stripe, like Stripe's not a payment processor. They're a pay back of payment tech, you know, uh, I believe. I'm pretty sure it's payment tech, but- Stripe is not its own processor. They're just a mm. huge ISO 
they're a huge independent sales organization. And because uh, no, you know how hard it is to build out what Teachers and First Data did. Like that is so, you're built. You're building one of the banking systems. Mm, you know, okay. so yeah, see. that's why there's so many. And sure, it's just the doubt. Like if you, if I were to put a picture up right now of like like the banking system, the Federal Reserve, and where processors come in, and then all the independent sales organizations, it is a lot. There's a lot in there, and there's so many hardware providers like. The hardware providers don't want to become processors. Okay. So they just work with ISOs like us, right? Okay. And then ISOs don't want to be real processors. We don't want to be the sales organizations because we're the ones that make a lot of the money from a small business aspect, right? Okay. But we have to go out and acquire the business. Um, so it would just it would completely change the business model, you know. But you know, I always wondered, I'm like, why doesn't Visa and MasterCard, Amex and Discover go direct to the business? Mm-hmm. You know, I always yeah, wondered because it would just yeah. wipe out a multi-trillion dollar industry, you know, in the middle of it. But There's, I get it, man. I don't like the no man right. either. Yeah. It's like wholesalers, you know, like wholesaling houses. <laughs> you were saying that you have a lot of agents across the nation. How do you even find them? Well, a lot of them we worked with at our previous companies. Um, and then uh, LinkedIn and then, you know, big association events like the Midwest Acquirers Association is coming up. There's one in Chicago uh, in July. And then there's another one in August. I think it's in August and Carlsbad. So everybody from the payments industry just goes to these things and just parties pretty much for like three days. That's pretty much all it is. <laughs> so like all good times, spotting you know, and making connections. Nothing new. Well, exactly. even in the even in the ed tech sector, we've attended quite a few conferences. It's the same thing, right, Vlad? Yeah. All the teachers come in, oh. the principals, the vendors. Uh, it's just, it's just. They're just coming in for the wine and steak and whiskey and yeah, the, you just the have fun. to yeah. know how to a talk, bit of which you are bad at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, I want to move to very quickly to uh, the fun segment of this portion. Uh, I'd love to ask you a couple uh, questions here. Uh, what is your favorite way to celebrate a big win or milestone once you accomplish it in your business? Uh, I, I'm a weirdo, dude. I stop celebrating it. Uh, and I just say it's part of the growth process and I keep my head down and I keep going. That's great. So like, I know you're supposed to like celebrate the wins and stuff. And I used to, I mean, when I got to like a certain number milestone, like I, we went out to dinner, you know, and like, you know, had some cocktails and stuff. And my wife loves to celebrate, but I also think it's just an excuse because she wants to get out of the house away from the kids to go to dinner. So, uh, so I don't she's blame like, her. you guys celebrate things? <laughs> yeah, I don't either, man. I, I like doing it too. But I now I'm at a point where, like mentally, where every time, you know, I do have a big win, like, of course I'm like, you know, like it feels good, but on I just keep going and yep. on to the next, you know, because it, at some point it's like you keep celebrating them and it's just, it doesn't, doesn't really do anything anymore you know like it's you're kind of just on this mission to get to uh and that's what i found out about this is i'm more i'm a lot happier when i'm productive when i am using my god-given abilities that i have and that's when i'm the happiest right so that's that's the process that i enjoy um and i like building things you know i'm just one of those entrepreneurs that likes building things i've just realized that i'm young in the journey still but um you know i yeah, I mean the celebrations or or whatever. But if somebody wants to go celebrate, I'm, I'm down. I'll go out. You know, let's go to Dominic's and have seven martinis, a, a 24 ounce ribeye. Seven martinis, you know? oh, man. <laughs> Not that many, no. That's what I, I want to. I'd be on the floor. Yeah. Well, Ira, it's been a pleasure. I have. Uh, we have a tradition here uh, on this podcast where we ask a question from the last podcast guest, and so you'll answer that, and then you'll. You will. I will ask you to ask any question you want us to ask the next the next guest. So the question, the last question that was asked by our previous guest, what's the most valuable lesson you've learned as an entrepreneur that you wish you could tell every aspiring business owner? Jeez, that's loaded. What's the most valuable lesson uh, that I've learned as an entrepreneur that can tell an aspiring business owner? It is to not focus on the result because if you're just focusing on the results you are going to be let down over and over and over again because i can tell you at every stage um of it i've realized that once i got to that point it didn't make me any happier it didn't make me any more fulfilled it didn't um 
Like maybe my life improved a bit, but it's not really changing my life that much, right? It's about enjoying the process and enjoying the journey and enjoying all the adversity that you're going to go through and looking at it as a growth uh, opportunity and just really enjoying the process, right? The day-to-day, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Uh, because I, I've read so many books and listened to so many podcasts that, of entrepreneurs that say, man, you got to enjoy the journey. And these guys are billionaires, you know, and it's like, I wish I would have done this, you know, and um, don't, don't sacrifice your family on the altar of ambition. And because uh, too many men in particular do that, uh, yeah. where they, you know, are very ambitious people. And they end up sacrificing their family if they have one. And at the end of it all, they're sitting in their high rise condo in New York alone with all their money and no family. Right. So don't, don't also don't take it too seriously. Like have fun with it. And you'll realize that you'll get better results uh, when you're having more fun because people like that, you know, very wise. Words. So that's why that's my answer. Very yeah, wise thank you. words. I love that. And I, and I completely agree with you also on that, by the way. And what question would you like us to ask our next guest? Any question. What size are your shoes? What size are your shoes? And can you drink seven martinis <laughs> in a city? <laughs> That's unexpected oh. twist in question. Next guest is going to be lucky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I Throw thank you. off a little bit. Thank you for a great conversation. Is there any... Yeah, uh, any please share with us uh, where our audience can find you, any kind of information that you want to leave them with. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Ivor Cornelius, and then also on Facebook as well, LinkedIn. Um, and then Pay Compass is our business page. Not the greatest on there because it's more personal brand stuff. But yeah, find me on LinkedIn and uh, Instagram and Facebook. Give me a follow. Thanks so much, Thank Ira. you, Ira. Thank you, guys.